lower Hudson Valley School District with a history of financial and management challenges is at risk of closing its doors before the end of the year due to a lack of operating funds. According to one of my next guests, Assemblymember Ken Zabrowski, a Rockland County Democrat, who's introduced legislation imposing a fiscal monitor to help right their ship. Welcome back to the show, Assemblymember. Great to be here again. We're also joined by the State Education Commissioner, Betty Rosa, who's backed this legislative effort. Welcome back to the show, Commissioner. Thank you. Glad to be here. It's our pleasure. So this issue did not come out of the blue as the East Ramapo Central School District has had state appointed monitors and local officials who have sounded the alarm about financial distress and a looming fiscal cliff. So Assemblymember, can you explain how we got to this point, including the impact of the vast majority of kids in the area actually attending private schools? simplest way for me to describe it is that this district has a demographic makeup where over 30,000 kids go to private school and about 9,000 kids go to public school. So over a three to one ratio. But that 9,000 is the largest school district in Rockland County. 9,000 public school kids is a big district. Three to one ratio of students equals roughly three to one, if not more, ratio of voters. And so the private school community or voters have failed each and every year now over the past decade, plus um, the school budgets. So the local contribution has stayed stagnant at zero, and no district can um, sustain its funding and its programs if the local contribution stays at zero. So um, there has been decades-long issues in this district, but the immediate financial issue is because every single budget now fails. Commissioner, what has the relationship between the State Education Department and the East Ramapo Central School District been in recent years as we've been heading toward the path that we're on right now? So sure. Uh, first and foremost, I, I have to say that um, and tremendous gratitude to Assemblyman Sombrotsky uh, for really for his courage in his role to really support um, what we call an equity issue in this district. And so we have worked with him in terms of um, originally monitors. We have worked with him in terms of monitors with veto power. And currently this idea of a financial board. And so every step of the way, and we've had many, many meetings along with the fact that we have ongoing conversations, I have staff assigned specifically to meet weekly and um, monthly with the uh, individuals that run this district from the superintendent to the monitors and the staff. And so everything we have been looking at and doing has been with the idea of really creating uh, the kind of educational system for this school district that the children of this community deserve. So we've seen in the past that the state education department has a responsibility to monitor and ensure that school districts, uh, private or public, are meeting basic requirements. So what authority do you have when you examine the East Ramapo Central School District to intervene, and what are the limitations of your power? Sure. So part of it has been because of the opportunities we have been afforded by um, each step of the way with the monitors and the monitors with veto power. So we've been able to insert ourselves uh, into the district much more so than any other district, right? By the very nature of veto power um, in the fiscal part of it. And we also have one monitor that looks at the instructional side of the house and the other one that is focused on the finances. And so the monitors with veto power allow our department to have eyes and ears on the ground and to have individuals that we interconnect with or intersect to ensure that the district is following on the standards work that's following the requirements for our special needs students and our English language learners, and that these students are receiving the kinds of services that they so need in order to be successful. And now keep in mind, on standardized tests, this is one of the worst districts. So that's not, obviously, all of this f- fiscal issues are impacting 
on the success of the students in this district. So, Assemblymember, you've introduced legislation to respond to the current crisis. How would this tackle the problem, either in the short term or long term? So, first of all, it, it has a spin-up of about $20 million of lottery aid to stabilize the finances. And can you explain what a spin-up is for people outside of Planet Albany? Sure. It takes uh, future lottery aid owed to the district and gives it to them now, and then they pay it back a little bit a year for 30 years. Uh, right now, they're at a situation where they're not going to be able to meet payroll by July. Um, they're going to use up their entire r reserves next year, and at several points, they're going to have a cash flow issues that they can't meet payroll. Now, those estimates were given to me with the assumption that they were going to pass a couple weeks ago a 1.99% budget, but that budget failed too, so it's probably worse than that at now. And then after this year where they can't make payroll at certain points, they're going to have deficits going into the following year of somewhere between 30 and $50 million. Um, and then into perpetuity, because like I said, each and every budget fails here. So what the bill does is essentially establish a fiscal control board over the district, and that fiscal control board um, would work with the current board and with the commissioner and the Department of Education to set a budget and a tax rate that is necessary to keep the doors open, frankly, for this school. In addition, it will be able to take out the capital bonds necessary to repair the schools because right now there are lead pipes that are not being repaired. The school district is literally falling apart, but the voters also won't approve a capital financing. What you have here in this district is a failure of democracy, and we have a long history in this country or in this state of not allowing a tyranny of the majority, right? We do step in when necessary to ensure the rights of the minority. And in this district, the minority is the public school students, some of our neediest students. As the commissioner said, um, students that have some of the worst test scores out there. Um, we need to step in to ensure that they have, first of all, a right to an education, that the doors open and they have a place to go next year. But second of all, that they have a, a, an education that we would expect that they're guaranteed in the state constitution that prepares them for the world. So in order to solve this problem, this is a drastic situation that needs a drastic remedy. And, and that's our responsibility as a state legislature. These municipalities function uh, via state law, and we need to step in when, when we need to in order to guarantee somebody's constitutional rights, which is what we're doing here, and also to guarantee that people have some level of equity and some level of justice, and that's also what we're doing here. Commissioner Rosso, what do you like about this bill and its approach? I think the fact that we contextualize this bill in terms of the history um, going way back from I have been on this board as a region as a chancellor now as a commissioner for 16 years and I have seen this uh, close up in terms of the lack of support for the children in this community I think the assemblyman speaks to the issue of equity speaks to the issue of having the ability to ensure that we are educating the children of this community. And in fact, all the signs point to the fact that we're not. We have a board that has particular vested interest in transportation for their non pubs that has really misused in many ways their power that is given to them to educate all children. And we have an obligation to ensure that, particularly in the fiscal areas, that we have a board, uh, individuals that are going to create guardrails and make sure that, in fact, those rights are protected. Can you elaborate on what you referenced there with the uh, non-public schools and this transportation issue? And for listeners who aren't familiar with the district, the vast majority of the private schools that we're talking about are yeshivas attended by uh, Orthodox or Hasidic Jews. But so can you talk about what the transportation problem is? Sure. First of all, we also should clarify that the majority of the board mm -hmm. are not representing the uh, pubs, uh, the public school uh, communities. I mean, for a district that has all these financial issues, they use uh, the door-to-door -door universal, this gender 
issues uh, with the buses um, are separate gender. Um, we have an expense account, uh, expenses that are un unbelievable that no other district has in terms of the transportation for particularly with the yeshivas. And in addition to that, the expenses in the special ed side that uh, we need to put uh, additional guardrails on the amount of services that the non-pubs uh, receive in terms of the special education and, and how it's controlled versus um, trying to make sure that we have a board that is looking at all of these expenses. You know, in this district, it's a public school district, yet you have a board that the majority of the members represent the private school community, and they prioritize funding for the private school community. So you have a busing system that is more expensive and um, provides more services, like the commissioner said, it's door-to-door -door busing, more than all the adjoining districts. Um, and that is extremely expensive. Talk about special education and things. So, and it's done at the expense of the public school community. And you have a, a, a public school system that doesn't have enough money, yet it's spending um, far above the average in these private school programs, which is exacerbating uh, the issue. And like I said earlier, now the chickens have come home to roost, right? They can't make payroll. They said there's not another municipality out there that is not going to be able to make payroll. And if they don't make payroll, the teachers are not going to show up, which means the kids are not going to be able to go to school, to any summer school programs, but also in the fall. If we do not deal with this now, I guarantee you this will make national news when the school doors don't open in September. So we don't have an option about whether or not to act here. And after a quick break, we'll continue our conversation with Assemblymember Ken Zabrowski, a Rockland County Democrat, and State Education Commissioner Betty Rosa. Capitol Press Room, a production of WCNY Connected, Syracuse. For listeners just joining us, we're continuing our conversation about legislation imposing a fiscal control board on the embattled East Ramapo Central School District in the Lower Hudson Valley, which is at risk of becoming insolvent. And our guests are Assemblymember Ken Zabrowski, a Rockland County Democrat, and State Education Commissioner Betty Rosa. We're going to pick up with the commissioner discussing the backstory of this situation. And it's important to say that, as the Assemblyman knows, We've been having conversations about this for a while. This is not something that just happened. I know that we've engaged with um, the governor's office. We've engaged with the Senate. And we have had many meetings at the local level in, within the district. And we've also had many internal meetings. This bill has taken a lot of work both on behalf of the assemblyman staff as well as our staff. A lot of considerations have been taken into account of how do we do this and, and do it with the best intentions of making sure that all children receive the kinds of services they deserve. The other thing is that, unfortunately, this district has also had a roller derby of superintendents. They, they bring them in and they're out and constantly hiring uh, superintendents and the board then makes a determination that a new superintendent will come in and it's a restart. There's no continuity, there's no stability, and it really doesn't help the district when leadership, particularly as a superintendent and staff, the staff in this district, the turnover, the lack of sustainability is beyond belief. Well, Commissioner, earlier we talked about the uh, transportation costs and the idea of funding the programs and services for kids with special needs at the private schools in the district. And I have to imagine there are listeners who are scratching their heads going, wait, but these are private schools. You guys are talking about public schools. Can you explain why there is some 
bleed over between these two when it comes to funding? Is there a state mandate to provide certain services? W why does public money end up with private schools? Well, obviously, the children who are in the private sector still under federal law, if they're students with special needs, mm -hmm. we must provide those services. So that's an automatic. I think what happens is in a district where the superintendent and the school board oversee the rec those recommendations, obviously it's an opportunity to take a look at what services are being provided, what's being paid for, and we're talking about whether it's services of OT, PT, sending them to other places mm -hmm. like Curious Joel, right, or other uh, remedies that are obviously part of this uh, engagement. These are expenses that the money has to come from somewhere, right? So it's just not the federal dollars, but it's also state dollars. So what ends up happening is when you have to make the cuts, you're going to make the cuts uh, not in transportation, and you're not going to make the cuts where the non-pub is involved. It's really impacting on the staffing, the services that are going to be impacting the public school right. students. Assembly member, how, if at all, does the fact that there is such a large percentage of students attending private schools impact the formula for distributing state education dollars? Does the district get, say, less money because of so many kids attending private school? They don't get the same per student funding for private school students as public school students. And I've heard some criticism out there suggesting that that's the fix, but they don't go to public schools. So they're not going to get the money that pays for the teachers and for the programs and things when they're not in public schools, right? And also, we, we are barred from sort of legally doing that. Now, they do get um, certain mandated services aid and some other things, right? Everything from like a comprehensive attendance policy, which essentially gives money to private schools for taking attendance, to the things they're guaranteed under the law and the Constitution, like busing. So I think this district gets about 80, and it's somewhere, it could be as high as 87% of reimbursement for busing. So that that is pretty high. Now, uh, look, I do think we can tinker around the edges of the funding formula because they do have to have more employees because of the sheer number of private school students. But at the end of the day, that's tinkering at the edges, right? There's a lag. So the private school community is growing so much that, you know, they have to pay for it in, in the current year, yet they're getting reimbursement based on last year's numbers. We could deal with that. But once again, tinkering around the edges. The real issue here is that the local contribution is stagnant for this district, and no district can, can survive if it stays at a zero. And like I said earlier, we've run into a failure of democracy here, so we have to decide what are we going to do. This is not a fun issue, right? This isn't a fun issue to get into. It's a very uncomfortable issue. Let's talk about what this is, right? You have minority students here that attend the public schools, uh, Latino, Black, Haitian, and they are some of the students that need the highest level of services, yet they're not getting that, and now they may not even go to school. And in the same respect, you have a, a global minority in terms of, as you said, the Orthodox population that happens to be the majority in this district. Now, you're, so you're dealing with sort of two minority populations that feel put upon. And so certainly that population is going to feel put upon by this bill. But we cannot allow the majority, whether it's a global minority or not, the majority in this district to not provide a public education. This is the cornerstone of how we, we give kids an opportunity. This is a public school district. Private school students have rights, but this is a public school district. We need to provide a public education. Is there a precedent, though, for something like this, either in municipal government or school districts, where the will of the majority, uh, you know, we're overturning democracy like this? Yes, we've had financial control boards. We've had them in New York City. We've had them in um, Nassau County. Don't they often welcome those, though, to a certain degree? This uh, isn't something that uh, the local community is going to want. Usually it comes with additional funding and additional help, right? So, um, 
you know, whether it's fully welcomed, I don't know. But New York has an, uh, an obligation to step into those situations. And that's what we've done over the years. So there hasn't been anything exactly like this. But when you put a financial control board into any of these local governments, you're usurping some level of local control and some you're stepping into democracy in some ways to stabilize that municipality. And that's what happened in New York City. That's what happened in Nassau County. This is slightly different. The government <clears throat> runs differently. But all these governments run based upon how we allow them to run. Small cities don't have public votes on, on, on school budgets. The city council and the mayor set the budget, right? So if we had a fiscal control board there, it would be the same level of oversight. The other issue is the fact that when the majority of the board can select the leadership and the superintendent, that's also an issue for the community. So in, in essence, the majority of the non-pubs are selecting the leadership, the superintendent, who is supposed to be the superintendent, right, for all children in the community, but primarily they're not overseeing the educational system per se of the non-pubs. And it's very, very challenging for any superintendent to come in with a board that is directing where the funding will be used. A superintendent, that's their contract is dependent on the non-pubs as a majority member. So that is a challenge in itself. The other, the other issue is that as we look to the issue of the conditions of these buildings, the conditions of the rating, financial rating for the community, they can't even borrow. I think they're one level above uh, you know, what we would call junk. Yes. <laughs> you know? So I think we know that. So the, f the fact of the matter is there is no investment in trying to really support all the children in the community. There's a specific investment of trying to do what is right in terms of transportation and other services for the non pubs If you have a majority of voting members, it is and you see some of the flyers that are out there voted down every year. It is v even with the wards and everything else, it is so challenging um, in a community that has many individuals that can't register, can't vote, to make sure that the voting ends up being, you know, supporting the, the pub uh, side of this situation. So by its very nature of design, uh, that you know, the fact that the num pubs uh, control by that very nature, you know that, you know, it's it's more than 10 years that you can't get this uh, budget passed. Well, let's flip the script. For those that are against this bill, let's flip the script and imagine a district that approved referendums, had budget issues and said, we're not going to provide private school busing. We're not going to provide private school uh, special ed. We're not going to provide the things that the private school kids are entitled to. They would have a right to come up here to myself and to the commissioner and say, the majority can't do this. You have to step in here for the rights of the private kids. And if those private school kids were Orthodox Jewish kids, we would step in because their rights would be trampled upon. Um, so, you know, you can't do it. You can't have a situation where the majority is able to violate law or step on the rights of the minority. So if the script were flipped, I think those against this bill would be pushing us for action. A hundred percent. So it's been reported that the East Ramapo district has essentially been put on notice by the state attorney general that she's going to probe uh, their administration for the uh, quality of the education they're providing and the actual uh, state of the building that the kids are learning in. Commissioner, what are your expectations for that probe, if any, or are you just waiting to see how it plays out? Well, I think it's a welcoming issue. I think it's long. Uh, in many ways, it's long overdue um, because of the fact that I think we've known for a while that, I mean, I, I have visited and um, I was glad that we did get the ARP money with that we were able to tinker around and do some repairs, but not the kind of repairs that we need. And I think that to the AG's position that we do need to ensure that these children are in in the kinds of environments that uh, provide 
uh, the kind of education that most parents want their children to attend. Well, finally, Assemblymember, this is a culturally sensitive issue, but it's also a politically fraught issue because the Orthodox voters are a coveted vote in maybe not necessarily statewide elections, but in communities around New York and the Hudson Valley and in parts of New York City. So what sort of headache does that present as you try to move this through the legislature? It creates an enormous headache, if I'm being honest, right? Um, But we can't let politics stand in the way of these little kids' futures and their education. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be dramatic here, but they already don't have the programming that they need in order to, 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 to truly succeed. And now their doors might not open. So every time I ponder this issue, and I understand the politics here, I say to myself, but what's the other option? What are we to do? We have to fulfill our moral obligation here and our legal obligation, irrespective of politics. And both of us have talked about uh, walking the walk with the moral compass and making sure that um, we really do what is the best interest of our children. Uh, I, I do think that I have been obviously uh, pushing on the same side of substantial equivalency. That's not that hasn't been easy either um, to ensure that we have our children are educated in the num pubs as well. As as you know, that's a, a a tough political position to be in as well. So when you think about the substantial, trying to educate all children on all sides. And you think about this situation, it is the idea of the equity and the the fact that all of us collectively um, have to rise above the politics and to ensure that we give every child in this state the kind of quality education, high quality education that they deserve. And I think that has to be the guiding principle in this process. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this conversation. We've been speaking with State Education Commissioner Betty Rosa. Commissioner, thank you so much for making the time. Thank you. And we've also been speaking with Assemblymember Ken Zabrowski, a Rockland County Democrat. Assemblymember, thanks for visiting us. Thanks for giving us the time, David. Support for the Capitol Press Room is provided by New York State United Teachers, a statewide union of nearly 700,000 professionals in education and health care.